chance to read that. Pay particular attention to the back. Those are the historians that stepped up to help uh, gain all the research that we have on these 10 buildings. And uh, there is a website you can go to to look at all of that research. So um, I know there's a few people here that help with the project that I can see, especially Ken back here who's been at Boston Listen News. He's here. If someone wanted to come tonight and they couldn't, they'll be able to watch it on the website. But um, since we don't have a lot of time, Sherry and Calvin and I want to thank each and every one of you that helped with this project, and we'll have a chance to do that later when you all stay for our celebration. We have cake. So, <laughs> and wine. Right, we have to say good more and wine. So anyway, um, without, oh, and Lisa. I want to thank Lisa, the manager here. She has had to go through a lot to help us put this together, too. So there's so many people to thank. This has been a true community volunteer project. So without further ado, Dave. Okay. Thank you very much, Ann. You know, so Ann introduced the members of the committee and didn't pause to give them a round of applause. Would you please do so? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I make a request? Sure. Could you please stand more towards the center there? Over here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's fine. A lot better. Ah, okay. <laughs> they make these cameras that only look one direction, so you got to stand where the camera's at. So anyway, Ken mentioned all the people that were involved. She didn't say that this project has been going on since 2017. Okay, think about that. Five years plus almost, you know, five months. Uh, and so if you were working for a private employer, that would get you a pay raise and an extra week of vacation. Uh, and so uh, I hope the committee members say something to you about that. Um, along with the efforts of the committee, I also think that one thing we don't do very well is, is recognize the people that are leaving the history for us to find. And so you know, the, the committee has worked very hard, and Calvin will show that off if he's anything like some of the previous uh, presentations he's made, that it's the people who do the meticulous record keeping to make sure we have the proper uh, chain of ownership of a building. Uh, the, the pictures that were taken of the activities of the day, uh, the stories that were written in the newspaper about uh, the events that were going on and what established you know, the, the culture that, that was being understood at that time, even down to the point of the stories that are told from one generation to the next, that those are all little nuggets that are left for us to find. And then once we get, that, get hold of that history, we have a much deeper appreciation but it's only done through the efforts of those people that we can't name right now. We wouldn't be able to you know, recognize their face. But yet it's important. And so for the record keeping that's done today, hopefully it's as good as what it was done in the past. So the project is good for helping us to appreciate what people were thinking back in the time. Uh, through that knowledge, you know, why did they do what they did? You know, and getting a sense of what was the economy of the time, what was the optimism as far as what the businesses were going to be doing. Uh, we, we learned to appreciate the courage that they showed for willing to take that chance, not only themselves, but also how they finance all this. And so there's a banker out there who probably was willing to loan them the funds and say, yep, we'll be your partner on this thing. We'll take some of your risk as well. And so that gets put onto the marker. The marker gets put onto the building. And if, as we walk around, it gives us a sense, what's the story behind this building? If the building could talk, it would tell us, but we can read. And so that marker on the building becomes our clue to how the history was back at the time of the building being built. And then as we walk around Oskaloosa, we're also impressed by the architecture of the, that we see. These buildings are distinctly different from one another. They were designed and built by people with the intention that these buildings were going to live longer than they do. They, they have the inspired architect who says, OK, I'm going to make a, a design that is going to, going to be able to handle the test of time. But it also needed to be multifunctional, knowing that there was some likelihood that as times changed, the building would need to be adapted, and that functionality was built into it. Then once you come up with that design, then you've got the skilled workman who comes along. And so he puts together a building that is a testimonial to his craftsmanship. And so as anyone looks back who built that building, his name is tucked in there somewhere. And then finally, there's the owner. 
He gets it when it's all done. And that building needs to be maintained for the decades to come. And so we appreciate all of that that goes into something as simple as the structure we're in. So today we're in what's now called the Book Ball. It continues to be as popular a place in Oskaloosa as its next door neighbor, Smoky Row. Uh, I tell the story that a few weeks ago we were interviewing city manager candidates and we were bringing them in from out of town. And as they got closer and closer to making a selection, we needed to have them leave City Hall so we could talk candidly. And we recommended that they go to Smoky Row and, and spend some time there. Instead, they came here. This was more interesting to them. And when they came back, they said they were just amazed at just the general design and how good it felt to be in this part of Oskaloosa, literally part of Oskaloosa's culture. So. Enough about my comments. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I, I wish there were more people, in a sense, because I think that Oskaloosa has a very rich story to tell, and this is just a, a piece of it. But I certainly appreciate the efforts that Calvin Bannister has gone to to research this, and so I'll hand the floor over to him. Hi. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. We do have some empty seats up here yet, so if you want to uh, not stand and sit for the, the, the presentation. This is the Oskaloosa Savings Bank building, and we are going to uh, say it was built in 1875. So that is the, the, the year that it was built. The, the year is sometimes uh, fluctuating on that because it was redone in 1906. Uh, we have to learn how to run this. So the building is considered to be neoclassical following its 1906 re uh, re renovation. And this is evidenced by that white terracotta appearance. It, it reminds you of the ancient Greek and the ancient Roman buildings. And as you can think of the Colosseum or you think of the Acropolis in Greece, that this is the reminder of, of that. There are two sets of columns on here. These are called Doric commons, which were very column. And then there you also see up above, there is a set of smaller columns up there as, as well. There is two sets of corbels, and those are those little uh, things that jut out that hold up a, a, a ledge that's there. Here is a small set, and there's a bigger set up here. And it's hard to see on this picture, but there is a spiral design above the doorway, which is also very typical of what you will see in ancient Greek and Roman architecture. There are sculptured eagles up above between those upper columns. And there is the classic pediment, which is that triangle at the top. And finally, and it's hard to read here, but you can see it if you go outside, there are actually Roman numerals, root numerals telling the dates uh, up there. It was a narrow building. It's only 21 feet uh, wide, and it was in the original plat of Oskaloosa. It's nestled between two larger buildings, Smoky Row and Browns, but what was called at that time, Smoky Row was the Frankel Building, and Browns was the Balduff Building. This is probably the oldest picture that we can find of the, the west side of the square, and it reminds you of this old western when you see the horses out here, you see the storefronts here, and this is our best guess of where the, the building was, was located. And as we go through these um, presentations, we like to see what was in previous to when the, the building was built. And this is the only picture we have found. Do you see this building back here? That is Oskaloosa's or Mahaska County's very first courthouse. The courthouse was on this side of the square at the time where the Iowa building is, is, is right, right now. In those days, the, the uh, owners were very fluid. You saw a lot of movement, movement in those pioneer times. The building changed hands a lot. The businesses came and go, went a lot. But one of the uh, businesses that, that we want to focus on just a little bit it was owned by Newton Hinton. And he was in that property. And there were actually two Newton Hintons at, at the time. It was a father and a son. The elder Newton Hinton came in Oskaloosa way in its beginning days, and he was a physician already at age 26 in the 1850 census. 
but by 1870 he was a druggist. And that was very common in those days without FDA um, approval for needing for new compounds and new remedies. The doctors just mixed their own when they did that. His son, who actually went into law, later followed the same uh, profession. They owned this property here from 1866 to 1872, which was one of the longest ownerships. And then they headed out west. The elder um, Henton went to uh, Washington State. The son went to Oregon State. Now this is a picture of the younger son, and he is well renowned for developing formulas for his, his drugstore. His biographer, which happened to be his great-grandson, said that he learned these recipes in Oskaloosa when he was wor working with for his father. And what recipes did he learn? Well, one for gonorrhea. That was the, the, the re remedy he had for uh, the solving gonorrhea. And if you had one recipe, why not have three different recipes to yes. formulas for, for gonorrhea? All in all, he developed nine different recipes to combat uh, gon gonorrhea. And I talked to Dee, our chamber director, and she did not want this to be on the sign that Oskaloosa was known for the uh, uh, gonorrhea capital of, of, of Iowa on, on here. Um, Hinton sold his property to Henry Price, and he did that in 1872. Henry Price was a jeweler, and he was at that time before he bought it on the south si side of the square. Here is a couple of ads that he had, and while he was a jeweler, he specialized in spectacles. And he has an ad up here for what was called a diopitric eye meter. And after you had that, that gave you perfect vision. Well, when he um, bought this building in 1872, the timing was not so good because in January of 1874, a fire swept through this side of the square. And Oskaloosa is defined often by its buildings, by the fires that were here. Our very first presentation was on the Oskaloosa Fire Station, and Mark right here did that. And the, the booklet that commemorated the fire um, uh, station talked about the major fires that happened in Oskaloosa, with this one being happening in 1874. The building right next to it was the Boyer and Barnes building, and that burned down as well too. That was a, a dry goods store. And we think that the building on the corner burned as well, so you had a big gap here in the, the west side of the, the square. So the city at that time, believe it or not, had an ordinance that said only brick buildings could be built on the square. They'd had enough fires that they had said that we're going to stop this by passing a restrictive ordinance that you could only put brick buildings on here. So this was the building that, that Price rebuilt. But because his lot was so narrow at 21 feet, he made a deal with Boyer and Barnes. He said, hey, I will pay for this entire wall here if you will do a thing for me. If you will build a stairway here and build a hall along here that my tenants could use. Because they built, he built a two-story uh, building and on the second floor were offices for attorneys, for dentists, for abstractors, for photographers, for tailors. All the professional people in Oskaloosa were typically on the second floor of the, the, these commercial buildings. And so they actually filed an agreement that went in the, the records that said Henry Price, he would pay for 100% of the building of this wall that, that came here if Boyer and Barnes would allow his tenants to go up on the Boyer and Barnes property and go through these two doors here to go to the, those offices there. That was agreed upon. Boyer and Barnes built their building with Henry Price's wall in 1874 and then Henry Price built the building in, in 1875, which is the date that we have as the origination of, the, of this building. Henry Price built a two-story building, only 80 feet, and he built a 20-foot, one-story building. Boyer and Barnes built a two-story building all the way, and instead of going just 80 feet for the hallway, they went way back here. Does anybody have a guess for what was back here behind the buildings? The privies. There, there, there is, that was where the privies were located and coal houses. 
you had to have places for coal back here so on these alleys the, the coal carts could come and deliver coal and that would be used for the, the coal stoves that would be up on, on, on the second floor. Keep in mind that because that becomes very important late, later on in, in this, this presentation. Henry Price was in this building, Boyer and Barnes in this building, and Sam Balduff was in this building. Sam Balduff was also a merchant and he was part of, of uh, Oskaloosa's large Jewish community at the time who were very, very successful merchants around with Isaiah Frankel in the Smoky Row building, another example of that. Here is a picture of the, the building prior to the 1906 renovation and you can see here how different this building looks now. If the renovation had not been done, we would probably be calling it an Italianate building instead of a neoclassical building because it had very similar features to the Frankel building here. And if you can see on this next slide, here is the hallway that was on the Boyer and Barnes building where you went upstairs and then hit the hallway where you could go either way into the offices that were here or the offices that, that, that were here. Another reason why I always like this picture here is if you look at this guy, he's on one of these big wheeled bicycles, you know, that had the little wheel at, at the back. You'll see that there, there are some telegraph lines up here. The trolley went right, right through here. Boyer and Barnes owned this building till 1889, and at that time they sold it to Sam Balduff, the, the merchant. And Sam, what he wanted to do was he wanted to combine the buildings. And he combined this building and this building in, into one. But in addition into combining it, he took out all the offices that, that were up here and he extended this building to the back so that it would be at the same length as his, his other building here. But he needed more room. So what he said to Henry Price, he said, I only have to provide you with a hallway 80 feet. I am going to shut this hallway off so that you can no longer use it to the end of, of the building. Henry Price said, no, no, no. That agreement says that I have, can go to the end of the building. Balduff said, no, the building only goes 80 feet. That's all what we promised to do. They squabbled for a while. Let's see. And then they sued each other. <laughs> and that, that lawsuit ended up going all the way to the Iowa Supreme Court. The suit was filed in 1889 to stop Balduff from closing off the hallway. Balduff used the firm of Lacey and Lacey, and of course Lacey is a very common na name here. The Lacey folks had been in the Balduff building in the offices there, and they got moved over to, to the uh, building owned by Price. The Mahaska County District Court, however, ruled in favor of Balduff. He said, he said he did have the right to close off the hallway. Price appealed all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court reversed that decision and said no, Price had to have an exit to the back hallway there. Balduff filed for a rehearing. Now, Balduff's attorney was a guy by the name of Seavers, and that is another uh, very well-known name in Oskaloosa history. He was an attorney here, but before that, he had been a judge on the Iowa Supreme Court. And so it was his fellow justices that turned him down that did the reversal. He went back to the Supreme Court on a technicality, and the Supreme Court again denied, denied the hearing, ruling in fav favor of, um, of Price. But during all that time, what did Balduff do? He kept building. He said, I, I have the right to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep building. I'm going to close this up. Price went back to the Mahaska County Court and asked for a permanent injunction to halt construction and rebuild the addition to give the hallway all the way to the back. The court refused and gave him a different egress plan, which was he only got 52 inches to walk past the 80 feet and then have a doorway that would go on his first story to, to the south. Price did not like that answer and appealed yet again to the Supreme Court. So that was the third time this hallway had gone to the Supreme Court, which is right, right over there. 
This court document showed an exceptionally nasty, nasty fart fight, like probably because of you had two attorneys there that, that were, were very well known. Um, when the, 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 the suit was filed, the attorney for the price, whose name was Lacey, he was renting there. So he filed an affidavit that said, closing off that hallway shuts off the light, shuts off the air. We can't get tenants to come up there anymore. They had rented all six rooms up there and were trying to sublet the fifth room and nobody would come. Seavers retorted and said, you know, that hallway is, is plenty airy and your affidavit is pretty airy too. It has no weight on there. You were not part of it. And, and, and by the way, you probably don't know how to rent a, a room anyway. Well, that did not please Lacey very well. And he said that he retor retorted that, that slur was completely unnecessary and just shows how weak Seaver's argument is. He also says if that argument of Seaver's wasn't so rambling, people could follow it a little better. And therefore, he says, I'm going to point out all the glaring errors, which he did. In addition to that, there was also some religious needling going on. Bolduff repeatedly, repeatedly said that Price was going after a pound of flesh. Does anybody remember where the phrase a pound of flesh comes from? Shakespeare, Shakespeare in The Merchant of Venice. And guess who the Merchant of Venice was? It was a Jew. So he said that, that he was turning the tables. He was saying that the, the non-Jew was trying to get the pound of flesh. Price turned around and said to Balduff, well, let him act like a Christian, at least in practice, to do unto others as he would like to have them do unto him. So it got pretty, pretty vocal and pretty um, um, nasty in that fight. The Supreme Court reaffirmed the ruling of the Mahaska County, giving only Price 52 inches to have access to his, um, his building from, from the hallway. Why was Price pushing this so hard? He was doing that because he had signed a contract to sell this property to the Oskaloosa Savings Bank in 1892 for 14000 So the court case went, went all the way for about a three-year battle that, that happened on, on this, and Oskaloosa Savings Bank was not going to buy the property until the court case was, was settled. Oskaloosa Savings Bank is who we have named this building, is the institution we've named this building after because it had been here so, so long. It was founded by J.W. Hannum in 1890, who was a decorated Civil War veteran from New Sharon. Hammond had already had a very successful bank in New Sharon and was decided to come to the bigger town. He brought in several Oskaloosa investors and he healed the relationship with Sam Balduff by renting the top floor to Sam. So that above this here on, on the second floor, there was the all of Sam Balduff's dry goods store and he was able to expand it that way. Hammond was also very good in developing innovating marketing techniques, which we'll see in a little bit. So here is the picture of the, the square from the, the south of the square. Here is the building of the Frankel building here with the Price building here, now the Oskaloosa Savings Bank, and the Balduff building here. I wanted to show you this picture because it will come back. This building was the Mahaska County State Bank. And that was the big bank in, in Oskaloosa at that time. That bank has eventually went to Mahaska State Bank and is now, now Mid Midwest One. But they were anchoring the, this, this corner here. You can see a little bit closer in here that same picture, how the, the uh, uh, Frankel building is here, the Price building or Oskaloosa Savings Bank here, and now the Balduff building. They had doors on this second floor that you could walk on both sides all the way through the buildings to, to go to the Frankel store, across here to the Balduff store without ever getting out outside. Some of the innovative marketing of the Oskaloosa Savings Bank, does anybody remember something called s &H green stamps? Oskaloosa Savings Bank did that with several merchants very similar in which you could bring in a, a get stamps with your purchase and once you filled out a book that had 20 places on it for five cent stamps, you turned that into the bank and you got a dollar in your savings account. 
if you kept that bank, that dollar there for three months in the savings account, you earned interest. And the interest rate then was 4%. So uh, how, it's been a long time since we've seen 4% on, on, on a savings account. That was very popular and you had a lot of kids that were opening accounts there. Then also the Oskaloosa Savings Bank gave away a lot of things. Here was a bookmark here with a Oskaloosa Savings Bank here and there was a calendar on the bank. This was courtesy of John Jacobs who collects all things Oskaloosa. Giving out free stuff probably helped them get a lot of Dutch customers in this area, I, I, would, I would imagine. And the final thing was a, a great service to the public. You'll see here they opened on every Saturday night from 7 to 9. That's when the, the, the band concert was going on right across there. And can you imagine asking a, a bank to be opened from 7 to 9? Don't get any idea, James, on a, on a, on a Saturday, Saturday night. So, so the bank was doing well. It was growing and was, was getting close to, to um, maybe even overtaking um, um, Mahaska uh, County State Bank. One of the new people that came into the bank suddenly in the early 1900s was Benjamin Buxton. And we have all heard about, about Buxton, the, the, the camp there. And this was the same guy that was there. You can see here that, that he was president already in the early 1900s. And here's J.W. Hammond here as cashier. Ben Buxton came into the bank the old-fashioned way. He married J.W. Hammond's daughter and therefore got, got, got into to the bank. He was a very young entrepreneur. He, in 1897, he took over the Consolidated Coal Company when he was just 29 years old. His dad gave the famous saying that, who was also running the coal company, then he says, I do not want to die with my harness on. So he left in, when his early 50s went back to Vermont. Ben took over and in 1900 began building the town of Buxton on 10,200 acres that was in both Monroe and Mahaska County. Frank Weatherwell, an Oskaloosa architect, and his father Henry, well known, we've talked about him on many of the buildings that we have done here, built the town of Buxton, had the first hundred houses ready in, in 1900. And to show a little bit how popular Benjamin was and how much business he brought, this is Ben Buxton's two-step. It was, a, it was a, a, a march that was done by C.L. Barnhouse that was made simply to, to honor ben, ben Buxton. And today, you can go to Barnhouse Music and you can buy the music for Ben Buxton's two-step in a full band or in a piano solo or a saxophone ensemble. In 1906, Ben decided to remodel the bank and he made it a very lavish and opulent uh, affair. Um, this was done in, started in 1906, which is why that we have the, the year 1906 that's etched on at the, the top. The entire second floor of the building was removed, making it a one-story building that had ceilings that went up to 28 feet. The Herald, when they did an article on it, said a complete description of this place is impossible and must be seen to be appreciated. One of the main features was a two-story vault. You can see the second story here with the other story behind the, the, the teller line. It had a seven-foot foundation of full cement, walls that were two to three thick that were lined with chrome and steel, and had a door of burnished copper. Up above, there were three skylights that were nine foot, foot square on here that had leaded glass to diffuse the, the light. There were two, and I had to look up this word, electroliers up front, which is basically electric chandelier that, that were between the columns that, that were on all night. Inside, you had white Italian marble, and the dark was black Belgian marble. All the trim was done of solemn, uh, solid bronze. And one of the most interesting things that I saw in the, the Herald about that article, it said, a special suite of rooms has been provided for the use of lady customers. There is a large room provided with tables, chairs, and a writing desk. This room will give accommodation to quite a party of ladies. And of course, what do you need when you have quite a party of ladies? A toilet room with a lavatory and a closet adjoins this room and has perfect equipment. 
So I don't know what perfect equipment is, but they, they had it. This is very hard to read, but this is the, the, the top pediment, and it, it has the Roman numerals of 1890 when the bank was founded to 1906 in the bottom line for when the, um, uh, the renovation was done. And you can see those numbers when you go, go out outside there. This was all going well, and then a new player came into the bank. By that time, you'll see that they had also extended the back of the building all the way to the back and had a two-story building to, to, to the back that was converted into a one-story at the time. It is believed that around 1919 or the fore part of 1918, R.K. Davis, known as Rufus, became majority owner of the Oskaloosa Savings Bank. He was a known figure in Oskaloosa. He'd been involved in government. He'd been elected to the clerk of court as the district uh, uh, court uh, person. He was in business. He was part owner of the Hawkeye overall factory. And he also had worked at Farmers National Bank. It was a little bit unsure how he got the money to, to buy this until we figured he had purchased the bank likely with funds from his wife, who was Sarah Crookham. She was the daughter of Judge J.A.L. Crookham, who had founded Mahaska State Bank back in the 1850s. That was the big building that, that we, we showed. The bank continued to grow, tremendous growth, in fact, that happened during then. But then all of a sudden, the, there, was, there was trouble that, that came, and this is, was, ended up being the, the demise of the bank. A news article in January 19, 1922, said Oskaloosa Banks in a, in a big merger. It trumpets this merger, giving Oskaloosa one of the strongest institutions in Iowa. All parties are pleased with, with the outcome. But there were some questioning items in the article as well. Several times the, ar the article mentioned bank examiner approval. It also mentioned that all banks were consulted, and those banks gave a press release in favor of it. And it said that officer changes were to be announced later in the year. All of those things kind of give a hint that things were not all well with R.K. Davis's management. When you think about that, that part of the, the, the time frame, you have to go back a little bit. We often hear about the Roaring Twenties. Well, the Twenties were not good for agriculture. Land of, of values had jumped up during World War I as there was a need for food production. And there was much inflation and there was prices of commodities went very, very high. All of a sudden, in 1921, deflation started. The country had deflation of 10% in 21, another 6% in, in, in 22. Land values had been, been going up, started to plummet. The merger that had occurred several years after that, R.K. Davis started bad-mouthing Mahaska Bank, saying that he had been wronged by this, and he asked the superintendent of banking to look into it. The superintendent of banking looked into it and came out with a ruling that Davis had nothing coming from that merger because Oskaloosa Ta Savings Bank was totally and completely insolvent. Davis disagreed with that, and in 1926, he sued Mahaska County State Bank. So once again, going to the Supreme Court three times is not enough. The case went, uh, involving this building went to the Supreme Court of Iowa again. And this is where the, the, the details of that merger came out that really changed the course of, of Oskaloosa history. The bank had had a troubling examination in 1921. All the loans were of all the loans, 22% were delinquent, were past due. Several were over the legal lending dependent. Depositors were getting nervous. Deposits had dropped from 1 million to 700,000 in just one year, and then in just 19 days in January of 22, there was another $50,000 drop. This was the days before um, uh, FDIC insurance. So your money in a bank was totally dependent on how well that, that bank was run, that you could get a bank. The de banking department had issued a letter that said the directors had to come in and guarantee those bad loans, 
and if things did not improve, an assessment, which is a nice word would be fine, would be levied on the stockholders to put money in the bank. Davis went to Oskaloosa National Bank and Farmers National Bank to sell it to him. They said, no, we will not buy this bank. The directors told him he had to go to Mahaska County State Bank to see about selling. We believe that there was maybe some bad blood between R.K. Davis and the bank that his father-in-law had started because he just never seemed to have a good relationship with them. On Saturday night, January 14, Davis called Mahaska County State Bank and said, I need to do something. On Sunday, Mahaska County State Bank's um, loan officers went to the bank and reviewed the books all day Sunday. After they looked at it, Davis said to um, uh, the Howards, who were running the bank, what do you think? And the Howards said, this bank is way worse than we thought. We are not going to buy it. That same afternoon, all the other banks were called to Oskaloosa Savings Bank, and they, they, they looked and discussed and thought of solutions until midnight that night. Monday morning, the 16th, withdrawals continued another meeting of all the bankers. Tuesday, another meeting with a Chicago banker present. He had said that he had been in, involved in a, a run in Chicago, and he says you cannot have that in, in Oskaloosa. One of the problems when you have a, a run on one bank, you have runs on all the banks. Everybody panics, gets scared, and starts to, to grab, grab the, their cash. And you can imagine how the words get out. If bankers are meeting till midnight, they go home and tell their wife. Their wife tells cousin Mabel. Mabel pulls her savings out. They hear it on the switchboard. And you just start the snowball rolling when, when that, that happens. Tuesday night, one of the bankers of Oskaloosa Savings Bank, it was not R.K. Davis, it was another director, went up to Des Moines in the dead of night and he, meant a, he met a bank examiner from the Iowa Department of Banking and said, this bank is insolvent. The next day, the examiner came down. All the banks were there reviewing the loans, trying to find a solution. They finished the re reviewing the loans early thir Thursday morning. $130,000 of loans were considered loss, complete loss. 44,000 were considered doubtful. The bank only had a $78,000 net worth. Well, when you write off 130,000 loans, you've lost your net worth already. The bank examiner at 3 in the morning declared Oskaloosa Savings Bank insolvent and would not w open up in the morning. That not only put the fear, of course, in the directors of Oskaloosa Savings Bank, but in also all the other bankers. Between 3 and 6 a.m. on Thursday morning, January 19, all the parties negotiated. They came up with a solution. Mahaskas County State Bank would take over the bank and absorb 36,000 of the loss. The other banks would write a check to Mahaska County State Bank just to help absorb the loss. They were that scared of what would happen to their own banks should a run happen in, in the community. The examiner levied a $50,000 assessment on the Oskaloosa Savings Bank shareholders because of the poor condition of the bank. They agreed to pay that assessment to Mahaska Bank, and Davis, having no cash, deeded his farm to the bank as his share of the, the assessment. When you add those three things together, that creates about $100,000, which covered all the losses that were there. A board meeting was called at 7 a.m. for both the Oskaloosa Savings Bank and Mahaska County Bank for their boards of directors to approve this. The bank examiner, whose last name was Reed, went down and started dictating a contract to the, a stenographer for everybody to sign. Around 8 o'clock, the t contract was typed up and was brought from Oskaloosa Savings Bank and brought over to the board meeting at Mahaska County Bank. R.K. Davis was there, and suddenly he had a change of mind. He said he was being sold out and accused the examiner of not protecting him. A director of Mahaska Bank stood up and said, if you're accusing us of stealing this bank from you, the deal is off. We're going to walk away. 
The examiner went downstairs and began dictating a notice to, put, to close the bank that the Iowa Department of Bank was going to take over the institution to liquidate it. This was getting right before 9 o'clock, before the Oskaloosa Savings Bank was going to open, and a crowd had gathered right outside the door, starting to kick in the door to, to come in. There was also people that had come around the alley and had gone through the Balduff store, which was rent at the bottom, and were trying to get in through the back. Total, total panic had set in Oskaloosa at the time. Davis backed up, decided to sign the terms of the contract. The contract was brought back here to the Oskaloosa Savings Bank for the director to sign and then again to Mahaska State Bank for those directors to sign. Through this back alley and they started moving the cash, the loan, the loan records and the deposit records back to Mahaska County State Bank. And at nine o'clock in front of there, the crowd was met with an officer of Mahaska County Bank and said, go down the street for your money. We will honor every deposit. And the afternoon issue of the Herald, as we saw, reports a happy and well-planned merger. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we've got a few um, uh, journalists here. Uh, re re remember that as you, as you do that. Obviously, the, the, that was not the case. Afterwards, as we saw, Davis had some, some remorse. I think he was full of bitterness because of losing the bank and sued Mahaska Bank. The local judge on the district court said, no, you have nothing coming. He sued for $176,000, which he said was the salvage value of the bank. That would be $3 million today, so a huge big amount. The district court ruled in favor of Mahaska County Bank. Davis appealed to the state Supreme Court, and that court also held, with, held the decision of the Mahaska County Bank, so Davis got nothing. And were it not for those court cases, we would not know all those events that happened there. Had Davis not backed down, there's a good chance that all four banks would have failed in Oskaloosa. And that's not unheard of. That actually happened down the road in New Sharon. New Sharon had three banks. There started to be a panic, a run. All three banks failed. The bank examiners went to Tainer Savings Bank and said, will you please move to New Sharon so we can have banking facilities there. The banker at Tainer went around to all the depositors, told them how strong the bank was. They didn't pull a dime out of the Tainer Savings Bank, and that's how that bank got in New Sharon. The bank building was now owned by Mahaska State Bank, and it stayed in the financial service industry for a number of years. It was rented to People's Trust and Savings Bank and Guarantee Investment Company until 1929 and then purchased by the Home Loan Association in 29, who owned it till 1963. And then another thing happened. They built a mezzanine up here. So at first it was a two-story building. Oskaloosa Savings Bank made it a one-story building. Now Home Loan put a second floor again to have that up, up there to have more room. And then after that, Chuck Russell's insurance and abstracting company owned and occupied the building in various forms till 98, and it was sold to Pat Lamberson in a revocable trust. And then they sold it to JJ Family uh, Enterprises, which is the Joe Crookham family in 2005. Now, this is just a really short entry, a brief here, but I, I really want to emphasize the importance of these last two entities. Chuck and Emily Russell were proud and big supporters of the Oskaloosa downtown, and they did everything they could to maintain the, the, the buildings here and worked hard with the Historical Preservation Group and other entities to maintain the character and integrity of the buildings. In fact, when Chuck sold it to Patricia Lamberson, he put in the deed that the front of the building could not be altered in any way. He put that much importance on it. The same goes to the Joe Crookham family. When they bought this building, they poured all kinds of resources into this to maintain the character and to provide one of the most unique businesses, an independent bookstore in a town this size you just do not find anywhere. So that is the story of the Oskaloosa Bank building. I want to thank you for coming and for your support of Oskaloosa's history and of the book vault. Okay. I'll turn it back over. Well,
have Calvin join us as our lead researcher, because as you can see, he's really good. And we've had the pleasure of working with John Jacobs from the very beginning of this project, who has provided countless artifacts and information that you would not even imagine that he would, someone would still have. But anyway, John has a, has a presentation for Calvin, a little hmm. present for that working, and then we're going to have to have this unveiling. Okay. Well, so. We'll let John Jacobs give this to Calvin first. And as a point as John is getting up, I wanted to let you know that Ken Alsep from Oski News interviewed Emily Russell, who is in her 90s, 92, by Zoom, via Zoom, uh, at her home in Maine, and that will be on our website. I just, on behalf of the committee, the citizens of Oskusa, and really the citizens of the county, Spend a lot of money on wrapper for this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's something to show our appreciation. Oh, very good. D. Laval cream syrup. For, 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 those, for those of you who don't know, I grew up on a dairy farm by New Sharon, and we used D. Laval as our, as our company for all the, the milking equipment. And I have some of that equipment in my, um, in my office. And the main reason I have that, whenever I'm having a bad day of banking, I look at a milking machine and say, you know, I could be milking cows. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, life gets better. So thank you so much. This will be in a prominent place in my office. Okay, okay thank you so the much. Okay, and we are going to have the unveiling in a minute. Just want to say we're, we're celebrating tonight. Our husbands, we're going to make a decision on the rain in the alley. Are we in the alley? They must be. Okay, Lisa was going to be generous enough to let us move in here, but we were hoping we could go out into the alley. So we will have, yeah, we'll have refreshments, including cake and wine. The and and uh, also, if you want to look through the building, be sure and do so yeah. with, a, with a vault. And so pay attention to that, that, that that is still here. And there's a lot of people that we need to thank. So like I said, we hope to do that in person. So we hope you stick around. But Calvin, it is your pleasure, honor to okay. unveil this one. So here is the sign that will be going on the outside of the building. Mm. 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 So, so we, have, we have Ben Buxton, J.W. Hammond, we have the advertising, and then we have the postcard that shows the building. Okay, and then this, as you know, I, I didn't go into a whole spiel. Most of it is in your program, but we do have... We decided that we needed our signs to be succinct with pictures and a few interesting fun facts because we felt that people wouldn't read Labor, you know, a lot of history at that point. But we do have a website that is hosted at the Haska Chamber. I think the hands up there. And uh, we will load this presentation from Ken as well as all of Calvin's research and all the other researchers have their information already there. Oskaloosa Historical Building Marker Site. So, um, Yes, this is hopefully appeals to everybody that might come into town, just some fun facts, but if you're really into history, you can get a lot from the website. So again, stick around.